All right, we're going to get started. Welcome, good afternoon, great uh, lunch and lunch panel. Um, I am Tom Ross, I'm the Circuit Court Judge in Queen Anne's County, and I'm the Administrative Judge in the Second Judicial Circuit, which is actually July 18th, the entire circuit is going MDEC. Just record the circuit court. So we'll let you know how that goes. Uh, and I also chair the Judicial Council EDR Committee. I'm Paula Hanford Agor. Um, I'm uh, I wear two hats. I'm from the National Center for State Courts. Um, one of my hats is the uh, director of the Center for Jury Studies. Um, so in a way, it's kind of ironic I'm here, uh, because in a lot of it, I'm trying to preserve jury trials from all going to ADR. <laughs> um, however, my other hat is on uh, civil litigation. And so I do a lot of research in the area of civil justice reform, um, particularly some of the um, reforms that are going around the, the country right now, so doing uh, evaluations of those types of things, which I think is how I ended up on this panel. I'm Jamie Walter. I'm the Director of Court Operations. Um, my office is responsible for doing um, performance measurement and um, program policy analysis. Um, and I noticed that uh, when you all came in, I set some PowerPoints over there for you all to pick up, but I don't think anyone actually did. So, Alan, thank you. If you wouldn't mind passing them around. So you can all follow along. I think it's passed up on evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're going to be fighting um, your brownies and cookies that are all in your bloodstream that you sleep in. But we're going to try and keep this lively and keep you all awake. Just, just cross out this report and put circuit for it. I just printed up those one that you sent yesterday, so assuming there aren't too many things. Yeah, okay. All right. This first slide, um, we're all very fortunate because I've only been given one slide to talk about. <laughs> we're going to hear from the researchers on the rest of the slide. But, but you can see that um, the landscape's actually changed a little bit since it was done in 2010. We have 14 of 24 jurisdictions that have mediation programs. Uh, most of those, I must say 13 of those, are mandatory at this point. Uh, and you may recall that the rules changed the last couple of years that allow judges to order not only settlement conference, but also an additional ADR process and most of the judges or administrative judges choose um, mediation to be ordered. Um, we all have lists that are usually maintained in the clerk's office. We all use those lists uh, in a different way. We, we, the magistrate and I, and of course I'm in a one judge county, um, we look at those lists uh, for every appointment which happens at scheduling conferences and make determinations based upon the type of case, the um, geogra geography for the attorneys, the mediator, because um, a lot of our cases may be a Western Shore case, so we're going to uh, get mediators from the Western Shore that are on our list. So we do not go from top to bottom, and there may be people on the list that uh, don't get any cases, but that's, that's a different issue altogether. But what we do have is about 20 core mediators that get cases of different types because they're very good in that type of mediation. Um, the average fees are $100 to $200 per hour. My sense is most of those are $200 an hour. Um, there are limited waivers. Um, I know we have, we have waivers for uh, mediation, some of which get paid then. They're usually in domestic cases, um, paid through family services. Uh, we also have community mediation that comes in on scheduling conference days before the magistrate and actually two mediators come and they take cases right from scheduling conference and we'll try and mediate the case that day. We also have a program where, um, and they're also usually domestic cases where they are referred for the next Wednesday because on Wednesday afternoons we have a mediator there who will do two, two different sessions. 
uh, from one to three and from three to five and we'll be paid the $200 an hour, but if we make a determination that um, uh, people can pay less, we usually have them pay $125 as opposed to $200 and make it up through family services. Um, most of the courts order one two-hour session. I know, for example, Anne Arundel in domestic cases um, <coughs> will do two two-hour sessions, but in non-domestic civil cases, usually one two-hour session. Um, there are means within the um, orders that will allow those to continue, but it would be at the same uh, fee rates. Um, most occur for us in the uh, mediator's offices or in an office that's been set up by the mediator to conduct the mediation. Um, there are opt-out provisions in the, still in the rules. Actually, that would be one thing if I could change it, I would do it, but um, <laughs> so that um, motions to opt-out can be filed in cases. Uh, we have probably had no more than five in the last two years just because um, I kind of control that process. And I know that I want them to go to ADR, so consequently, they go. Um, if somebody does file such a motion, I usually require them to come in and explain why they think they need to opt out. If they miss the 30 day limit, then I won't let them opt out. Um, ADR deadline usually before the discovery deadline. Um, I guess that is true in most of the places. It actually is not true in Queen Anne's. We have on our scheduling order allows the ADR deadline um, is actually seven days after the discovery deadline. And that allows for the, there are a lot of, um, that's probably a trade-off because a lot of attorneys want to complete the discovery uh, before they do the, um, or have to do the ADR. So while they have to set it up right after the scheduling conference, um, they can set it up at a date that's after the discovery deadline provided it's in that seven-day window. Um, you've heard a little bit of, um, in the last session about uh, we have, um, had coaching pilots in the Second Circuit. We actually uh, we had coaches that were um, allowed by Macro through a grant who would actually watch the mediators mediate a case, and the parties obviously would sign off on that, and they did involve uh, civil non-domestic cases. And we had two mediators who were very good mediators, trainers, who watched the mediations and then conducted two-hour um, discussion with the mediator after the mediation was over. And we found that worked very well. There was a lot of tribulation about it to start with. I got some um, calls about it, uh, whether I was gonna get the information about it or any of that, um, but we found that once they did it, I did hear from a number of the mediators that they really appreciated that level of training, if you will. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you. Um, I think it's important to sort of set the landscape of what civil general programs are like in, in Maryland. And, um, you know, our research questions are, are in some ways very similar to the rest of the research projects you've heard about. But there are some things that are unique, for sure, about circuit court civil cases. Uh, so our, our research questions broadly are uh, comparing people who use ADR with people who do not, who use the traditional court processes. And we'll talk a little bit about how we collected that data and some of the challenges we had. Um, we wanted to also look at the total cost of the case. What is the whole cost, not just uh, dollar values, uh, but what does it mean in terms of the impact on the court, uh, in terms of um, additional depositions and things of that nature. Um, and so, as I mentioned this morning, we had a bit of an evolving methodology for this. We started out, before we even really collected any data or did it any um, pilot testing, you know, pilot testing is when you, for those of you who are non-researchers, you try out your methodology on a couple cases or a few people to sort of fine tune it to make sure it's gonna work, make sure that the way you're asking questions makes sense and then you give uh, participants a chance to sort of respond and say, I don't like the way you asked that question, so you can find your head. So this, before we even got to that point, we started thinking about what questions do we want to answer? And one of them is, of course, is the idea of, of uh, what's going on inside the mediation. 
and we had some conversations with some attorneys and mediators and um, just and their feedback was very negative they really did not want to have us in these mediation sessions um, they felt like it was a breach of confidentiality they were they were worried about the records we were keeping if they were discoverable there were lots of issues with that that um, so we decided and there were other issues as well in, ter in terms of trying to really capture the sort of not just mediation, but the negotiation that goes on, because there's a lot of pre-work in some, for some mediators, they do a lot of pre-work. In some cases, we find that there are, the attorneys are negotiating over the phone. Um, so trying to capture all of those points in a case really kind of gave us pause. I think it's important to keep that in mind when you think about something like the day of trial research, where, Lorig did an incredible job with that in terms of the logistics and all of that, but in some ways she's lucky in that they all are coming to the courthouse at the same time. You know you're going to get lots of cases at the same time, and we didn't have that luxury here, so we had to really think through what to do. Um, so one of the uh, so we quickly scrapped the idea of doing observations in uh, mediation sessions. Um, so the the second the, the first one we actually piloted was trying to track cases through their life cycle. So that involved us doing things like sending out a survey to the mediators pre-mediation, and then they would fill out this mediation survey, the participants would, they would fill it out afterward, and also the attorneys would. Um, that gave us quite a lot of logistical challenges as well, because we would find that orders would be vacated, you know, Judge Ross was, was um, talking about that. We find that sessions would be moved. Um, they would use a different mediator than we thought they were moving. So we, we were doing things like, logistically, it became very difficult. We were uh, overnighting packages out to mediators. And if you think about who these mediators are, in some jurisdictions, there, it's community mediation. Uh, they're not getting paid a whole lot anyway. Um, and they were really not particularly happy with this level of work we were asking them to do. It's, it's a, it was a burden. We're, there was no question about it. Um, tr we were trying to get at some of the questions through a survey that through the observation we could get at by watching them. So asking them about certain things that they might do in a mediation. It just became incredibly long uh, and they pushed back and rightly so. So, um, so what we ended up with then is this sort of bookend of surveys. So we're looking at cases at the beginning near filing and cases when the case is concluded, sending out these packets, uh, sending them out to the attorneys and sending them out to participants. So this was, given our budget and, and the willingness of the participants, a much more feasible study. Okay. So our final methodology, we uh, looked at four sites, uh, Baltimore City and Baltimore County, which had already had robust, uh, long-standing ADR programs in civil. Um, all of those cases we were considering our treatment cases because we didn't try and tinker with that. We didn't ask them, since they already had this well-established program, we didn't ask them to send some to mediation and some not to. Um, we also then recruited um, Cecil County and Howard County, and Judge Ross was, from that November meeting, I remember Judge Ross came up to us and said, why don't you use the Second Circuit? Because Cecil County has a program and Talby County or other counties don't. Um, and we, like I said, we were on a race, because that was a nice match. We had two, a lot of these counties would have the same, uh, the same um, attorneys. Uh, they would have some of the same mediators. But what happened is Talbot County started getting an ADR program. Um, so we were really in a race. And then the smaller jurisdiction, the smaller counties in uh, the Second Circuit, we just didn't really feel like we were going to get enough participants. So because these two programs, Howard and Cecil, were really new programs, they were very kind enough to let us tinker with it a little bit and uh, send some of them to mediation and some of them not. So um, I have to really give a great big thank you to them for, uh, for all of these counties because it, it took a lot of uh, pre-work, a lot of relationship building on our part and them being very patient with us as we kind of thought through this and practiced this methodology. Um, and so what we ended up doing for Cecil County and Howard County, which are both, um, 
medium, Cecil's medium small, it's a medium? Medium. 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 Both medium jurisdictions. Um, we would send half of them, at the scheduling conference, we would get, um, at the scheduling conference, we would get uh, them randomized so that we would send a, a notice to the ADR coordinator to say, half of your cases are going to mediation, half of them are not. We would try and do it by uh, equally divide between uh, motor tour, contract, and then other case types, which included pretty much everything else, right? Declaratory judgments, um, jury trial prayers from the district courts, um, quiet titles, which I'm not exactly sure how what that is, but the attorneys in the room, I'm sure do. Um, and uh, no. All of those were cases from 2014. Okay, so so our final methodology in terms of the data that we're collecting in the pretest, we're looking at their experiences coming into mediation. What are their experiences with mediation? Uh, what are their experiences with each other, the other parties? What are their attitudes about mediation or court processes? And I could have gave you a little heads up about that already. Uh, about what they think about mediation and, and what they think about the traditional trial process uh, and what their goals are. Uh, what do they hope to get out of this case, for instance, or what are their client's goals? Um, in the post-test, we're looking at, um, again, their attitudes, what is the timing, uh, what is the impact of various negotiation points, like negotiating at settlement conference, negotiating uh, prior to mediation and, and uh, things like that. And one of the questions we had, of course, was cost. So we're looking at the actual cost and the hypothetical cost from that point on had they gone to trial. <coughs> okay, so our survey packets that we mailed out, uh, these survey packets included the introductory letter. We had a letter from the administrative judge. We thought that that would be a little helpful to have it from the administrative judge rather than from, let's say, me. They don't know who I am. Uh, they don't, and if, if we had it from the, um, the chief judge of the Court of Appeals, they may or may not know who that is, but certainly <coughs> the attorneys in a community know who the administrative judge is, right? Um, so we were hoping that that would help us a little bit in getting a, a larger number of respondents. Um, and we also sent a reply envelope along with it, so we made it as easy as we could. Uh, so our response rate, um, <coughs> We mailed these out to 811, um, in 811 cases, and you'll see that the, the number of counsel that it was mailed to and the number of participants. Uh, in some cases, we didn't have the correct uh, addresses for counsel. That's why it doesn't equal to uh, two counsel per case. Uh, but everyone who we had a current address for, we mailed it out for uh, participants and respondents. Um, the participants were not, did not have a particularly high response rate. Um, and we're thinking that part of the issue may be, like I said, they were suspicious. We did have some phone calls from the respondents and the most common question they have is, is this a scam? <clears throat> Um, you know, at the time in 2014, and even now, sometimes on the judiciary website, we have up announcements saying, warning, there's a jury scam, or uh, warning, there's this warrant scam. Uh, and so I think that people are a little more wary of that. The, the attorneys think we're much more willing to reply to this survey, maybe because they did recognize the name of the administrative judge, or they see this from the court, and they're more willing to open it. Uh, and it's coming to their law office rather than to their home address. Um, so that was certainly a challenge for us. Okay. So just to sort of put some perspective on this, um, I, the first thing when I was reading through the initial draft of this report that um, Jamie was good enough to share with me, um, my immediate re reaction was, I so feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> um, a, lot of, a lot of research methodologies, um, particularly in this area, when you're trying to get at um, court research and events that don't actually take part in court. Um, you can't observe them in the courtroom. They're not normally captured in the case files or on the case management system. It's a real challenge. And so surveys have always been sort of the go-to, you know, horse that gets it done. Um, unfortunately, I think what we are seeing today um, that sort of explains some of your response rates as well, and, and you can see from some of our recent experiences, 
is that we have entered a period of just survey fatigue. Every time you open up your email, every time in the mail, you know, won't you answer a survey, won't you answer a survey, won't you answer a survey. Um, I know I routinely blow them off anymore. <laughs> it's like I, I can't deal anymore. Um, and so we've really seen, you know, it used to be sort of the, the standard was, you know, for a mail survey, you would want at least 40% response rates um, to be able to have, you know, any type of confidence. Um, ideally, you'd like to have, you know, 60 to 70% to have any type of con confidence. Um, the recent work that I've been doing with the National Center that have been involved attorney surveys um, that involved multiple follow-ups, um, email and, and cover letters from the Chief Justice um, in, from the Utah Supreme Court, from the Chief Justice of the Texas Supreme Court, um, follow-up reminders, um, uh, folks that we had seated in the community who were going out and talking about and putting in the bar newsletters of the survey is coming, please participate. Um, and with all of that work going on, um, the Utah one, we got a 19% response rate from attorneys. In Texas, we got a 14% response rate, so we matched you. Um, Except there was a there was a special ADR component of the Texas evaluation that we were doing, um, and so we actually directly targeted all of those cases that we knew had been referred out to ADR, and that one was only a 10% response rate. Um, and I've I've since heard from some colleagues at the Federal Judicial Center um, that they are also in, in regularly encountering um, pretty awful response rates um, for surveys. Um, so I think this, you know, sort of as a larger one, um, really raises the question of, you know, can we continue to use surveys as, as a reliable method, or are we going to have to start looking at some other methodologies, um, either doing the triangulation, <coughs> um, the triangulation method of, you know, can you sort of come to it from a couple of different angles? Um, so one that we've been doing regularly um, as part of this is just working with case level data. <coughs> um, even with things that are don't take place in the courtroom, sometimes they can give you some pretty good um, indicators of things that you actually want to design your surveys around, of things that you see in the case de data. Um, Ideally, if you have good data in your case management system, you can work from that. Um, working with courts around the country, I can say there is a great deal of variation in the quality of data that's in the case management system, um, both in terms of the granularity of the of the code. Um, you know, I, you'd like to think that you know a product liability case is different from a debt collection case, um, but if they're just sort of part of civil, um, it's really hard to tell. Um, so the granularity is a real issue, as well as coding issues, um, when particularly if you're working in multiple jurisdictions, um, just or even within a jurisdiction, um, of how different clerks will actually code things. Um, so those are some, some real issues that, that happen with the case management system. Case file review, um, at least you've got, you know, you can sort of actually look at the case file um, and use your own coding system of, you know, read the complaint read the answer. You can actually see some, some of the details there. But the, um, that also depends on sort of how, you know, what normally gets filed in the, in the case. And that can vary from court to court as well. Um, not to mention how well are those case files maintained. Um, it doesn't capture, you're obviously, you're missing things that aren't happening in the, in the courthouse. I mean, the, both the Texas and Utah work were very interested in discovery and what was happening in discovery. And so, other, unless you had a, a motion to compel or a motion for protective order, um, you know, usually the most you would get would be a service of process that the, the discovery request had been exchanged, if that, and not always that. Um, so that's one way, but it does sort of allow you certainly to control and know that for the surveys that you're getting back, are the characteristics of the surveys matching the characteristics of your total population of cases. Um, and that can be a very useful control. Um, and also just sometimes you'll see things about how, how cases, the manner in which they're disposed, and the timing of that um, 
with regard to key case events that you can pick up from the case file or from the case management system, that those can actually be um, quite useful for sort of thinking about, so what's, why are we seeing this pattern? Um, the other one is just telephone interviews or focus groups. Um, again, if you, usually if you can get people on the phone, um, or get the lawyers on the phone and sort of explain um, what, what it is that you're doing in a much more targeted way, you can sometimes get higher response rates. And it also has the advantage of just you're able to sort of do some follow-up um, and, and probe for if you're hearing sort of a, a confusing or an unusual question of just uh, uh, going a little bit further. Um, but I, I would suggest that people who are doing research in this area, um, the case level data, you know, it's likely to be more time intensive and labor intensive, and I think we just need to be thinking about that when we're developing our research budgets um, as we sort of hit the limits of what we can do with a survey. And I would say too that our, at this point our case level data doesn't capture a, uh, enough of what we would probably like about what's going on in terms of ADR, and I think Nick can probably speak to that a little bit about, because he's been working on trying to get some data from all the circuit courts about their ADR uh, processes and the programs, and it's certainly a challenge. Um, and as uh, Judge Ross mentioned, his county, his, um, his circuit is gonna be going on MDEC, the New Electronic Court System, uh, case management system in July, and it's rolling out around the state, and at this point, it's uh, there are very limited things about ADR in MDEC. I think it's a goal for a lot of people to put that in there. Um, MDEC stands for Maryland Electronic mm -hmm. Court System. Um, but at this point, there are, there are other things that we need to work on with MDEC to make sure it runs smoothly before we can work on that, right? The other thing, I, I, I give her great kudos for even trying to get litigant um, data, because I, I threw my hands up years ago and said, no, I, I won't even try anymore. Well, we appreciate, we do appreciate the attorneys uh, who replied. So we did end up with three data sets um, based on this. And so we have the attorney data set, the participant data set, and the post-mediation surveys, which have kind of described what is going into those. And really, it's the, um, sorry, uh, the attorney data set which really gave us the most robust information and uh, this is still a work in progress uh, we are still in the thick of doing data analysis um, with this data set so so far it's really the um, attorney data set we have done the most work on um, I know Haley and others are gonna be spending the summer kind of digging through this data and getting us some some other deeper answers for this as well all right so let's talk a little bit about the findings um, so the, just to get a sense of who is involved and who we surveyed, uh, we had 223 attorneys uh, answer the pretest, and you can see a little bit about who they are. It's, about, it's pretty split, pretty much evenly split between um, counsel for the plaintiff and counsel for the defendant. Uh, you can see the counties listed as well, where they came from. We asked them about their experiences with the other party in the case, with the other attorney, for instance, just to understand their relationship going into um, these negotiations or this ADR process. And so we asked them, like, do you socialize with each other, uh, things like that. And the one that, the one question that came up as the most common, 51% uh, had experience as the other party as, a pony, as opposing counsel. So they're, they're pretty familiar with each other, I'd say, um, at least in the attorney role. Now there are uh, other characteristics. Uh, these are, for the most part, pretty experienced litigators. They uh, devote a lot of their practice to litigation. Um, they have, on average, 25 years of experience. Uh, and we're gonna see some things about what their experience is, uh, what difference that makes in terms of their attitudes towards ADR. And they had experience with uh, ADR at settlement conferences. So they're an experienced group. And I think one of the questions that comes up a lot about ADR um, mediation, particularly in these large civil cases or motor torts and things like that, is are the right people at the table, right? Are you getting the right people at the table? So we ask questions related to that about uh, is there an insurance company involved? And who has the authority to settle? Now, if anyone's doing the quick math, 69% said the client had authority to settle. 44% had the insurance company had the authority to settle. That's more than 100%. Uh, I know it's afternoon, but we can add still, right? Um, but that is because they could add, they could check more than one box, right? That's what that means. Okay. 
In terms of client goals, money was the key difference between the plaintiff and the uh, defendant. They all, 75% of them said that money was the key difference. We asked them about how much money they were, would settle for, and how much that was being offered. Uh, the difference was $127,000, uh, just to sort of get a sense of what these cases are like coming in. And uh, let me just uh, mention too, remember these are attorneys' replies. We don't have the participants really in this data set. We're not looking at them because we don't have enough of them. So we're looking at what the attorneys are reporting about what their clients want. So how accurate that is about what their clients actually want, I think is a good question to ask. Right? They may be thinking their clients just want money when really they want an apology, Right? for instance. Okay, so Clients' goals as reported by counsel uh, for the differences between the, um, the attorney for the plaintiff and the attorney for the defense, there are differences. We find that the attorney for the plaintiff, they're saying they want the, the uh, client wants an apology. Um, they want some kind of non-financial change, which is a change in behavior, a change in policy, for instance. I want the business to do something different that they're not doing now. I want them to have this new policy in place or not have a better return policy, whatever it may be. Um, restoring their dignity uh, was something that the attorney for the <coughs> plaintiff endorsed for their clients, saying that that was important for them. And then also, um, finally, the one that we have, which is sort of a trend, is avoiding trial for reasons of confidentiality among the defense is one of their client's goals. So the attitude questions that we asked the attorneys uh, before they even answered any questions about this particular case or about their clients as they're going through the survey packet, we just asked them some questions about what are their thoughts on mediation? What are some of their thoughts on um, the court system? And we did a factor analysis, which allows us to see which questions are kind of lumping together, which questions are answered by people in a similar way. And we found really that there were two groups of replies. One is this group that we call preferring trial. They say um, they're more likely to say mediation is a waste of time. Um, mediation doesn't work. They prefer trials. They feel pressured to mediate. Um, they're less likely to say that they have a clear idea of what they want to get out of a mediation, and they're less likely to say they have hope that they'll be able to resolve these issues in mediation. Now this other group that we see are willing to mediate. They are less likely to say they feel pressure. Uh, they're more satisfied with the judiciary. This is even before they've done the mediation, right? So maybe they have a more, this more positive, they have a more positive attitude about the judiciary in general. Uh, they have a clear idea of what they want to get out of mediation, and they say that people are more likely to uh, comply with a voluntary settlement. I think that's something that people in the ADR community will say, uh, that people are more, as one of the selling points for ADR, right, is that you're more likely to comply with a voluntary settlement. And then certainly the research from other areas today that we've talked about are probably showing that because we don't have these enforcement actions as much in uh, cases where they're coming up with these solutions on their own. Jamie, do you yeah. know what the percentage of the, in each group uh, the overall? I'm going to get to a little bit okay. about some of their characteristics. I will say this. We did look at this, diff whether there was a difference between plaintiffs and defendants. And there was no difference. So attorneys for the plaintiff, attorneys for the defendant were just as likely to be in either of those groups. Okay. I think, remind me if I'm right, there was a difference in terms of the age or the yes. amount of experience um, with younger attorneys preferring the trial, um, falling into the preferred trial and the older, more experienced attorneys um, willing to mediate, which really yes. comes to, I think, an interesting dynamic that I've seen um, some uh, work that I was doing out in Oregon. Um, they had uh, put in place what they called their um, expedited civil trial, um, which was really intended as a way for younger lawyers to get trial experience. Um, they had really gotten to a, to a point that um, the, the bars to getting to trial were, were so high, um, particularly in lower value cases where you would, you know, which is where as they described to me that uh, the younger younger attorneys when they'd have civil civil trials in their district courts their limited jurisdiction courts when they eliminated the the jury trial option for the district courts 
um, there was really no place for, for attorneys to just go and cut their teeth um, in how you actually do a jury trial. And so I went out and did a, a series of interviews with um, some of the attorneys that had participated in this expedited civil trial. And I was really quite struck um, especially talking with some of the younger ones, um, of how they view this in terms of overall sort of career development. Um, that this, this whole issue of having um, jury trial experience, in particular, um, less so with bench trials, but especially jury trials, um, is really becoming a niche market. And so they were looking in the context of their law firms that, um, that the, the senior trial, trial attorneys, um, the members who are the, you know, the American Board of Trial Attorneys and the American College of Trial Attorneys and all of the names there, um, were senior partners, very successful, nearing retirement. And they saw themselves that if they could get that kind of experience, and so they would usually be pushing for opportunities that if there was a case that had, you know, a real dispute as to the law and the facts, that they really wanted to try those cases um, instead of trying to work it out in, in, in a settlement negotiation or mediation or ADR. Um, because of sort of this, this is my opportunity to step into that particular one. There's, there's another one that has come forward too, and I thought it was an interesting of uh, and, and I don't know how many of the, the mediators in Maryland sort of routinely do this, but sort of this, um, particularly in the let me tell you how it's going to go, of let me tell you what a jury, what a jury would do with this case. Um, with a rapidly decreasing actual body of knowledge for making those. And so that there's sort of this issue of, I want that experience so that I can actually give my clients an informed Opinion about what a what a jury would do with this, um, as opposed to simply the you know what I heard from you know listening to anecdotally, which put on my Center for Jury Studies hat is mostly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. okay, so let's look at who actually attended mediation. So we know that uh, they're all that in this group. We're really ending up with a lot of people who were ordered to mediation. Those who were. Um, in our random assignment, the ones who were not ordered to mediation really didn't reply. So at this point, they're, they're basically out of the study. So we're really looking at those who were ordered to mediation, those who went, and those who did not. Uh, overall, we have about 59% of them actually are going to mediation. And there are some differences by case type about who is attending mediation. So that group of other, uh, administrative agency appeals, um, med mal, uh, injunctions, all those things like that, they are um, going to mediation, about 63% of them went to mediation, went to their scheduled ADR session. Um, so we are seeing some differences by case type that I think are worth exploring further. Uh, I think we're going to need to sort of dig in a little bit about into the data to see maybe what it is about these cases that make the attorneys uh, or the clients more likely to go to mediation. One, uh, one of the things that we really noticed when we plot out when these cases are resolving, so remember we're asking this at the end of the, when the case is concluded, when did it resolve, we're seeing these two different points in time, really two groups, one of which is people who settle the case uh, within 30 days after the ADR deadline. So anytime within that group, uh, that time period, and then those who are settling it after that. And so there's our, our split <coughs> of when these are happening. Um, so the red line is those, well, this looks kind of black here, sorry. Uh, those who attended ADR, and the blue line is those who did not attend ADR. Again, it gets back to that maxim, which is that um, attorneys settle cases, Attorneys settle cases when they're prepared, right? And they settle cases, they're, they're prepared when they have meaningful events, right? So if they're going to an ADR session, uh, even if they're not settling it at the ADR session, there I know that there's there, there's been discussion in the ADR community about this as well, that preparing for ADR uh, gets them ready so that they can do that negotiation. Because the attorneys work on these cases, they're not working on these cases for a year and a half, right? Constantly. They're working on their cases right before a meaningful event is about to occur. And that's when they're really ready to have these discussions and have this settlement. 
Uh, and I think it's really important, it gets back to one of the um, comments that Judge Ross made about sort of the context of ADR is, I think it, it, it's important for program managers to think about, or uh, judges to think about, when are you going to schedule ADR compared to when you have discovery, right? In your county, I know you do it, you have the ADR, um, you have ADR it's after the, yes. Yeah. Okay, so we looked at these two groups of uh, when the case concluded, whether it concluded within the 30 days, anytime within that 30 days, from the time they filed to within that 30 days to 30 days after the ADR deadline. We're seeing some differences between those groups. And of course, you can see it in that graph really well. There's just this group that does not want to go to ADR. They seem really motivated to go to trial. Um, we know that they are um, younger attorneys. Their older attorneys, or the longer they have been um, litigating, the more likely they are, say, to settle early, right? They're preparing for this case, they're getting ready for ADR, and they're settling within the 30 days before, uh, after ADR. Uh, so I think there's some interesting issues there. And contract cases, again, we're seeing that these are settling later. They're settling after that 30 days past the ADR deadline. By yes. ADR deadline, do you mean mediation deadline? Yes. Do you mean settlement conference? The uh, mediation deadline, yes, thank you. Okay. okay. Um, so I mentioned before um, one of the evaluations, it's actually, we're, we're just finishing up now, but um, they said I could talk to you all about it, um, is uh, doing an evaluation of some rules that went into effect in Texas on a statewide basis um, in 2013 um, called the expedited actions rules. Um, these are non-domestic civil cases, everything, it's mandatory, and it's everything um, valued at $100,000 or less. Um, it basically has an expedited time frame for discovery, um, for mediation, for trial, and expedited as in like a, a one-day trial um, with specific times for, um, for cases that, are, that actually end up going to trial. But an interesting piece of this um, of the rules was that they clamped down quite a bit on the use of mediation um, in uh, in Texas. Um, the the reputation in uh, Texas for court ordered mediation, which was which was pretty prolific across all of the courts, um, was tended to be viewed as this is full employment for retired judges. And so a lot of the, a lot of the district courts and the uh, county courts of law basically had standing orders, um, and here's our list of our favorite our favorite um, former colleagues, um, and I hope to be a former colleague one day too, um, of ordering people out automatically um, into mediation. Um, so put in some rules and basically said, you know, you can't automatically order. Um, as part of a standing order anymore, um, the mediation if you if you do order it, it can't be for you know more than X amount of time or X number of dollars. Um, just we're not going to put up those. Now, the parties obviously can ignore that. I mean, there's no way to sort of enforce that. And if they said yes, we really really do want to go to mediation, um, you know, we could take as much time as we want with it. We can choose our own mediator. We can pay as much as we want with it. Um, but we were sort of interested in that piece of it. And so we, we looked at sort of this pre and post, um, got cases that were filed in 2011 before the rule went into effect, and then cases um, filed in 2013 after the rule went into effect. And we did see um, a diminution in the number of cases that were referred to mediation out of standing order. Um, wasn't, uh, you know, it basically dropped in half. Um, it didn't disappear, um, so not everybody got that memo. Um, and an increase in motions. So the parties, you know, parties and attorneys have said, yeah, we really, we do want to go to mediation. We think it would be useful, and that one increased fourfold. Um, so a little bit, not significant decrease in the um, in court orders by court by court order that was specific to a case. And it's hard to interpret that. I mean, you know, either a they didn't get the memo. Um, and they still got their retired friends that still need still need the supplemental income, um, or possibly that this is sort of the out of court that this is being done, you know, through during a, um, a case management, and it's not actually being recorded 
um, in the case file as such, um, but the parties are actually asking for it um, during that, so it's an oral communication as, uh, as opposed to a, a written motion. Um, so we saw some of that. What we did see as we were looking, and this was sort of looking back at the, at the um, case level data, was that the cases that were referred into mediation, um, that sort of before and after, um, had a much higher level of conflict, um, either because of um, you know, discovery conflicts or other type of conflicts. Um, so something about this that, that um, whereas other cases that didn't have as much were settling without being referred to mediation. Um, so it suggests maybe sort of a more strategic use of mediation, that these are ones that, that could, you know, the, the ones that could settle on their own, you know, why, do you, why would you want to actually take the extra time and money to, to have it mediated, although there's some data here now that maybe suggests there, there's a positive benefit, but, um, but the ones that are actually being mediated having some. Um, but interestingly enough, only about 26%, one in four, of those cases actually attended the mediation, um, which was, you know, sort of, again, sort of, it's not, this is not a universal one. And I think we came to the same conclusion that this was sort of having, having the referral to mediation with a specific deadline actually works in the same way that, you know, in the 1970s and 1980s, we talked about a firm trial date. Um, that you've got this meaningful event coming up, you have to prepare for it, and if you actually sit down and take a good hard look at your case, you're going, okay, yeah, let's just get this done. So. Okay, so the next question we ask the attorneys is, so we know the timing, we looked at that timing sheet already, the timing chart. Uh, we also asked them uh, how the case was concluded, whether it was through uh, direct negotiation between counsel with the mediator, uh, with the settlement conference judge, or uh, with a verdict. And so I'm just gonna show you a few highlights from this, ones that really stand out for me. Um, we did this as a regression, controlling for their attitudes going in. Because remember, we know that they have these, we have some people who are naysayers about ADR, and we have some people who are very pro-mediation. Um, so a few things that I think stand out is one of the things that uh, we see more of is with direct negotiation between counsel was those who attended mediation. So it's not, and it's not with the aid of the mediator, right? So again, it's not necessarily what's happening in the mediation that's, that's the be all end all. It is this whole early preparation, being ready for mediation. Maybe me the process of the mediation helps them better understand the case and then they can settle. And then I'll just make one more point of the idea of money because that's gonna come up again. We see uh, those cases who uh, received a verdict from a judge or a jury, they're uh, less likely to be complex cases which I think sort of is a question we would ask, like why is that? And it may be that they're, because of the complexity, the parties wanna talk through the issues more. They wanna talk through the issues with the other attorney and figure it out and come up with a resolution. And money, again, money is not something that's gonna be making it to trial, it's the major issue. They are willing to talk about money before they even get to the courthouse, before they even get to trial. Okay, so what's the impact of the pretrial process? Uh, in this one, we're asking the, we asked the attorneys, um, did these pretrial processes result in a settlement? One being, sort of to get you a scale, it was one to four. One being, it didn't really, it was not likely to help us resolve, um, get a settlement. Four being, it was very likely to get us a settlement. And to me, when I look at this data, what really it's saying, is those who attended mediation, those numbers are lower overall, right? And if you look at those who did attend, who did not attend, they're rating these a lot higher because they're kind of looking for other opportunities to do these negotiations. They're not doing it in the mediation. They're doing it with negotiations prior to the ADR deadline, negotiations after the ADR deadline, and negotiations before trial. So they're looking for all these different opportunities to talk to the other parties rather than doing it in mediation. Uh, the, so one of the questions we have is we know that there are differences in goals. Do these goals make a difference in terms of whether they settled in mediation? And, and the only goal that we found that was significant in terms of whether they settled in mediation or not was 
the goal of having their voice heard or telling their story. There's a trend for this non-financial change, this behavior change for policies, but we've really, at this point, we don't have a, a very big N at this point, a big sample size. Okay, so when we look at uh, these post-test attitudes, um, I think there's a few things that I want to point out here. One is um, those who did not attend mediation say that the outcome favored their client whether it was a defense or plaintiff. Those who did attend mediation said that the outcome was balanced, which I think is really fascinating. Um, and the other one I wanted to point out is those who did not attend mediation say that the case could have been resolved more efficiently without ADR. So they're not even going, and they're saying it's more efficient that way anyway. So we're gonna challenge that assumption in just a second. When we look at attorney's fees, uh, these are actual fees, so this is at the end of the case, we ask them, how much did you charge, what were your billable hours, uh, plaintiff and defendant, and so we're asking, it's efficient for who? That's what I would ask them. <laughs> right? It's more efficient for their client. Is it really? I mean, look at the, we look at the cost difference. Now, again, there are differences in who's going to mediation, who's not, in terms of the case type. So there is some conflation there that we really need to think about. Um, all right, so our next question is, we know that they're settling early for ADR. We know that they're settling later for the or mediation. They're settling later for ones that are not going to mediation. So we asked the attorneys, and this is a question they really hated. I know in law school you're told never to answer hypothetical questions, and they have all learned it. Because we asked them to give the, if you had gone to trial, what would be the hypothetical cost, additional costs to the case? How much more would it have cost? That was the one, those were the kind of questions that they were most likely to leave blank. They didn't like that, uh, but we did get some really interesting data from it. Um, okay, so we look at the dollar value in hours, how much more would they charge? And I just did this at the end, which is adding up what their actual cost was to that point, and what they said their hypothetical cost would be to go to trial. And you have this number down here of 23,000 for those who attended mediation had they gone all the way to trial, and 45,000 for those who did not attend had they gone to trial. So we don't know exactly what's going on there. We know, again, we know the what they're saying. We don't know why they're saying it. Are they uh, underestimating, overestimating? Um, but I think it's a, I think it's a fascinating finding uh, that they're saying <coughs> the attorneys who are saying who are not going to mediation are saying this is a really expensive case. Uh, we looked at this also in terms of plaintiffs and defendants because we have some questions about are there different motivations for defend the defense attorneys versus the plaintiff attorneys and really we're finding again that this uh, the additional depositions is really what we're finding is different in that um, those who uh, attend mediation versus those who do not, whether they're plaintiffs or defendants, the, those who attend mediation are gonna say that they need more additional depositions um, to conclude the case if they had gone to trial. Okay, oh, I know Judge Ross uh, said he had only one slide, but we're gonna give him a couple extra. Um, so sort of round this all out. Um, because they've been doing some really great data collection in Queen Anne's County, so. Well, I don't know what that is. I've never seen that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what that is. Okay, so no, I, no, no, no. I took this and I made this. Yes. <laughs> well, you better go to the other one. Okay, so I took this slide of his and I turned it into this so we could see that graph the same way that we had it earlier. Uh, but so those two slides are exactly the same data. I just I like the graphical version of it better. No, I like the other one better. Okay, so we'll go back and forth between the two. Look at whichever one you like. Um, Basically, the good part of this for us in Queen Anne's County is this is essentially every case, and I'm hoping that Nick White, the researcher for the ASC, is going to help me with this uh, and make it even better, because this was, we started with our civil non-domestic uh, mediation program July 1st, 2009. This begins July 1st, 2009. Obviously, we don't have the numbers that other places have, but uh, we take into account every single case. Um, those are the total, when it says civil, that's the civil, not domestic. 
um, total family. And then the next two totals are interesting because um, one is the mediations occurred in the courthouse, and the other is the mediations occurred law office somewhere outside the courthouse. And these are the statistics that were put together that show the percentages for each of those. You can tell in a, in a one judge court uh, trials occur much more often than in other places. For example, I've heard the number three, four percent for uh, civil non-domestic cases actually going to trial. Ours is 12 percent. Um, and I've heard various numbers for um, domestic cases and a substantial percentage of our cases do go to trial, but again, a substantial number of cases do resolve along the way. And what I'm going to try and do with the statistics that will end this seven years from July 1st, 2009 to June 30th, 2016, is add some things into this, such as when cases resolved, whether they resolved within a few days or 15 days of the mediation that was scheduled, uh, rather than just paying prior to mediation, because that could be a fairly significant time frame, and whether they resolve within five or 10 days after the mediation, whether they resolve at some point that's just before the settlement conference, because as was said, a lot of these are based upon preparation for a court event, and I wanna measure that at some point. And we have very few cases, in fact, no cases uh, uh, in today's day that will settle on a trial date if it's a jury case, they don't settle on the trial date because we have a special rule for that in our circuit. Um, and the other cases can settle on the trial date, but as you see, the numbers are pretty spread out. And the other thing, or well, there are a number of things I'm going to be looking for Nick to tell me what we need to look for, because we're what we're trying to do in putting these numbers together, this involves going through at this point about a thousand court files and we'll probably end up being closer to 13 or 14 or court, court files but actually going through and one of the things I did not measure but want to is the partial settlements along the way that do occur particularly in family cases but also in civil cases where at some point liabilities admitted or settled and so the only issues become damages so I want to measure that and have when those things occurred because what happened in a number of the cases that I looked at initially and simply decided I can't do this right now is that cases would actually partially settle at mediation, partially settle at settlement conference, partially settle somewhere along the way and so the trial might be on, for example, a domestic case, child support, marital properties decided, custody decided, so I want to have all that uh, down there and anything else Nick tells me to do. <laughs> Uh, Nick, you've been um, commented on a few times in this um, session. Do you want to make any comments about uh, the data collection processes that are happening through macro? I would say I think you're right. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's really relationship building, I think, with the courts. The courts are designed to do certain functions, right? And when researchers come in, well, wait a second. Are you going to impact my time standard? What's this going to do my staff resources? So if folks are interested in that, we're sensitive to that, but we'd love the help and support in the future of what is it we want to learn in your jurisdiction and how can we do that in a way that's as minimally disruptive to your staff, but also allows us to get reliable and robust data. It's, um, and it varies from the type of questions you ask on what we can do. I think that there's still there's still a lot, I think, in the civil area to explore. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot to explore. And we have to both have resources on our end and resources on your end and an interest in trying to figure out what's going on here. How can we tweak it? What do you want to keep the same? People think by evaluation has always changed. Sometimes you want to keep the things that are working well, keep them working well, and tinker with some other things. So um, I just want to make one last comment about this, uh, a few more comments about this slide. Uh, the, one of the reasons I wanted to make this as this chart like this is that it really does in a lot of ways mirror uh, the chart from before. And I think it's, um, 
it's really interesting to I highlighted the red uh, as the is it red over there yes okay good uh, for civil because we're, we're this is a discussion about civil but I think it's really interesting again to see these peaks uh, and valleys of when cases are are getting to settlement um, and as I said it's pretty similar in the patterns to the data that we saw and um, you know, I'm a data nerd, so when um, Judge Ross sent this, I was so excited because I, I was just really happy to see that there are courts that are keeping this data as well. So one of the uh, messages I would say, too, is that it doesn't have to be a um, federally funded uh, grant with researchers coming from state universities that come in and help you collect data or to gather data. Uh, these are things that you can be doing uh, in your own courthouses now. And some courthouses you have the, the luxury or the, the benefit of having uh, staff who are really trained in um, research. In other cases you don't, um, but that shouldn't be necessarily a, a hindrance for you because there are those of us at the administrative office of courts who are more than willing to help as well. People from my office or, or Nick from Macro, um, any one of us are available to really help you out in creating a database like this. And um, you know, Judge Ross is doing a lot of this on his own, really. Well, one thing I learned um, about this process, whether it's setting up a program of mediation and getting the lawyers to buy into it, or um, not having them opt out, or uh, doing these surveys, whatever. I mean, it's obviously a top-down thing. If they don't see that the judge is invested in it, it's not going to happen. So that's the most important thing I think. The questions for us? Yes. Uh, I'm just going back on the prior slides. Um, I, I, Do you want the chart or the table? Either one. Okay. I, 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 just, I, I, just, I am just not understanding what the, um, the bottom two rows, what the cases are. Okay. These are, these would add up to this. This is the total number of family cases. These are mediations that occurred inside the courthouse. Uh, okay. These are mediations that occurred at some other location. Okay. So the bottom rows are all subsets of family. Yeah, this is, this is just, it's all family cases, yeah. okay. all the same kind of cases, really. Okay. But some of them are being done at the courthouse, and some of them are being done okay. outside the courthouse. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yes, yes. I have three questions. Okay, we're <laughs> ready. So um, a number of the responses were from attorneys who did not attend the mediation. Yes. I would like to understand what how that came to be. It sounds like opt-out is an option, but in your court at least, not very many are allowed to opt-out. So I would just want to know, how is it possible that you had attorneys respond? Well, they can um, uh, file a motion to vacate the order, right? I mean, we have those people from there, those there's jurisdictions a rule, here. There's a in Maryland, there's a Maryland rule that they can opt out at, uh, within thir prior to 30 days okay. for any reason. Okay. Automatic. And so then they would be okay. So it's automatic. Right. So two of the. Yes. Go ahead. Um, well, it's automatic, but there are different definitions of automatic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> automatic. Just well, in some automatic places, we don't have a judge run. I was just it saying, wasn't I me. Judge actually, it came from yeah. a. <laughs> Can I ask a question based judge, on judge that? Right. They, where the attorney didn't attend the mediation, did the mediation actually occur? No. Uh, no. Right, so another way they can opt out is they just don't go to mediation. Correct. Yeah. Okay. The Which attorneys part? never call the mediator. Nope. Mediator never sets it up. No mediation ever. Happen. That's part of our logistical challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Haley? Yeah. Right, yeah. sending out those mediation surveys and then having nobody actually show up. <laughs> <laughs> we were with this. Well, also speaking to Roger's thing, just so, so we're clear on this, because it doesn't happen in the hands of anyone either. Um, when the order goes out for mediation, there's a deadline for that mediation and a requirement that a report be submitted to the court within seven days of that. And that's what the ADR coordinators, part of the job is to make sure that that happens. So if it doesn't happen, they're going to have to explain why it didn't happen. And sometimes, like I just looked at one um, yesterday, the indication that came back on the report was um, that the parties could not do it that day, but we're going to do it on May 31st. So it was a few days outside of time. But at least we knew that it was going to get done. 
Yes, okay, so you're on your so second question. <laughs> yes. Uh, I will, I'll save it right away. So, uh, you had one chart regarding two attitudes before ADR, a group one that preferred trial and a group two that was willing to mediate. I was just curious, what percentage of the attorneys were the ones who preferred trial versus percentage that said willing to mediate? And then my last question is, um, I understand that the number of um, responses you got from parties was really small. Yes. But at the same time, it would be, will you still look at them? Yeah, we're gonna, like I said, we're going to be spending the summer digging through this data. Um, to answer, we have a lot of questions we still haven't answered. And I think the way, so I'm answering your second question yeah. first, if you don't mind. Um, I guess, the sh well, I answer your first question, which is we don't know, I, we don't, I don't have the number on oh, right now, but we'll have that in our final report, for sure. Um, there are so many questions we still want to ask about, or, or answer about this from this data set. Uh, the way I see it is the participant data Although it's not as robust as certainly the, the pre-trial information or the or early data from the attorneys or even the, the data at the end of the case for the attorneys, I see the participant data as really supplementing it. It can give us some good information. Even if we can't do um, methodologically what we talk about as inferential statistics, we can still do some descriptions about it, like understanding who these, what, what their uh, attitudes are about mediation. Have they ever been to mediation before? Um, just a, a, what are their goals? So it may not be able to say it has a, a statistical significance of 0.005, but I think it's going to be really helpful um, going forward. And you know, one of the things that's really come out of this, um, which has been so helpful to have conversations with Paula about, is we have learned, I think, so many lessons about just gathering data from this project because there were so many things that seemed like they were gonna work and all the research would say, yeah, this is gonna work. And then you do it and it's like, nobody wants to answer that survey. Or we tried this way and it doesn't quite work. So, you know, it's given us a lot of, just the data that we have now and knowing what worked and what didn't, I think we have lots of great ideas about what we can do next. Yeah, you had a question. Uh, yes, I was working with Haley on this and, um, one of the things that might answer a little bit of why you did not get participants formed is I spoke to a lot of my mediators because I was on them. I was hounding them to return Thank you. the forms. <laughs> and I was on the phone with them. I would email them. And, you know, you got to return these forms. So finally, um, I got some responses from the mediators on my roster that they said that they, that's not what's in their practice, that they'll, they'll fill out the mediator form but they're not going to push the parties to, to fill out the rest of the forms. Some of them don't even bring it up. They just skipped out altogether and just filled out the, uh, the mediator ADR form. Then I had... Uh, so I may just before you do the second uh -huh. part, so that's probably part of it's like their comfort level. Comfort level. With, so. with doing this sort of, like what they want to have is a very voluntary process. Correct. Feeling like this is an, an intrusion to that sort of space that that's created, correct right? that's what I had a lot so we actually with the help of Haley we wrote out uh, a little snippet of what you can say to them prior to starting the mediation instead of giving this at the end of mm -hmm. the mediation the second part of this is I had a lot of attorneys contact my office regarding these forms and they a lot of them were just this is against confidentiality right. give me the reason why I said well this is coming from Maryland Judiciary <laughs> I you know and, um, but I did tell them, explain to them um, how their the information is confidential, et cetera. So I had a lot of attorneys say, well, I filled, it, filled out the attorney form, but I'm not requiring my participant to, set, to fill it out. I don't right. want my participants to fill it out. Mm -hmm. So I'll do it to please the court, because the administrative judge, we had her assign a letter right. to the, so they're like, we'll do it, but I don't want my, my actual clients filling these forms out. Mm -hmm. So that could be That's a, a huge challenge. That could that. be yeah, right. a little bit of why your participant for I tried and tried. Um, but we we know you did. Me too. But I'll tell you what, it, yeah. it was very hard to get the attorneys on board. Yeah. yeah. There is and just sort of the, the big caveat that'll have to be if, if you are going to be reporting on the participant data is because it's so small, mm -hmm. you really have to worry about your self selection bias. Right. Who are the people one, who are doing that and do they one, one of the ways you can probably increase it? is send it directly to participants themselves now and especially in this mm -hmm. day of technology if you can capture and one of the things i've been asking in mdec and i don't know if it's even there is getting email information about the plaintiffs and defendants and put it into the mdec right so you can send 
surveys like this directly to the participant with a survey monkey form so they fill it out there, they're more likely to do that instead of bypassing the attorney altogether right. and send it directly to them. They're, they're a participant in a, in a litigation. You can I know that that's a goal in MDAC is to have addresses and to speak about that. Yeah. I mean, one of the benefits of that, I mean, there are benefits certainly for us, for my office in terms of collecting yeah. data, yeah. but there are lots of benefits there are a lot too. Of reasons, yeah. And like being able to, e I mean, you, I get an email when my voter register, I mean, my registration for my car is about to expire. Go exactly. down, get your, M go to the MBA, and, or they allow you to do it all online. So that, I mean, that would be a great benefit for but, this. Yeah, but to get that We're just about out of time, but yeah, Toby in the next week. I just want to say that this kind of the way that this grouping came out, it would be interesting See, so I know that the district court, um, particularly for pretrial, tracks attorneys that have said, I'm not willing to meet. Um, and then there are attorneys that say, uh, I, I, when, when we do intake, we ask, do you believe there's an attorney involved? And they decline. Uh, there's usually some follow up uh, as to if it's for this particular situation or is this something you don't want to receive any referrals to mediation in the future. Um, and we, we track information, we tell them, you know, that we're, is it okay to share that with the, with the court? And most of them say yes because if they don't want to participate in mediation, they don't want to be getting these calls from us, right? But we do kind of seek that, that permission to share. Um, and so, it, that's a, a set of information that the district court has and tracks. And so as you're kind of looking at these attorney attitudes and tracking where they settle, it just also seems like maybe this is a set of information that we're not utilizing. And is there a way to go back and track do those cases, similar cases, settle earlier and, and so forth? So just yeah. something to consider. That's great. Uh, Nick, I'll just do a follow up on the panel reset. It's interesting that district courts may train their mediators in their roster to introduce the idea of a survey, a voluntary survey at the end as part of the opening statement. So it's not a wait, we're just, they talk to them about don't give it to them when they're going out the door because they've met the right. contest. They're done. These are small things, but they get a 50 to 70 percent return rate depending on the year, which is amazing. Yeah. Another thing is in that scenario, the Baltimore City, Baltimore County Bar, we had a meeting with them, is winter, and unfortunately it's towards the end of the research cycle. But by the end, the attorneys present were saying, well, what about this question? Can you answer this question? Right. It's like, yeah. well, I can make the survey longer. <laughs> I know. So if you engage <laughs> yes. the people and get them understanding the power of it, but it takes a lot of effort and energy to do that. So it was mm -hmm. wonderful, though, to have them say, yeah. oh, I want to know the answers. Yeah. Which This it is why we're doing this today, is yeah. people a lot of people in this room put a lot of work into this in a lot of ways. So I, wish, yes, I, I wish we would have done that in the beginning, like Nick said, because our mediators, who were also attorneys, they they were all over it. They yeah. At first, they were like, well, why do we do that? And, they, and we thought it was going to be a great session, but it actually turned out to be very informative. They want to know about this and that. And oh, this. yeah, it was and That great. may have been our, our first one that we piloted. Yeah. We had that version of it, and it, it was, was just too great. long. And I wish yeah. we would have brought it to the Bar Association to get the attorneys on board with it, because oh, yeah. we did get a lot of um, Maryland chapter attorneys who were saying, "Hold on, uh, we never. We, I know we heard about this, but not really. Like it wasn't really brought to our yeah. attention to do this. So when they were, the mediators brought it up, and it, you know that's where the questions started. The mediators were kind of like, well, I don't know. You're just gonna have to call Anna Marie, so or Macro or Haley. So." Right. But yeah, that's I, I did find that. And that's when they call Haley and say, this is a scam. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take your question afterwards. So we have to get yeah, we're going to have to take a break, and we're in the moot courtroom at 3. Yes, we're back in where we were this morning. Thank you two very much. Thank you.